corpses, <laughs> okay? All the things that we've talked about in those first 16 verses, which by the way, when it comes to understanding the biblical church practically, those previous 16 things are big. They're big. And I hope you realize and I hope you understand as you look and have paid attention to us preaching through those verses, the church doesn't do that a whole lot. This American church isn't, we've got this thing messed up. Okay? Paul says here, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord. I mean, what he's telling you is, This is big. I'm testifying that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness but ye have not so learned Christ. Now, now listen. Make sure you understand what Paul is saying here. Don't assume what he's not saying. And what I mean by that is we look at that list and we go, oh, yeah, that's unsaved people. And that is true. However, do see what he is saying, Christians, you don't walk like this either, which means what? You could. You could walk like this. Hence the reason why he's going out of his way to say, therefore, I testify, don't walk like this. So I just want to make sure as we're going through this, we all don't fall into the trap. Well, he's talking to unsaved people. No, no. First of all, he would have no reason to write that in the book of Ephesians if all he's talking about was unsaved people, right? He's adding this because he's saying, okay, guys, here is the practical understanding of the biblical church. Don't walk in the vanity of your mind. Don't walk in darkness. Don't walk in ignorance. Don't do those. Again, which means we could walk in vanity of our mind. We could continue to walk in darkness. We could continue to walk in ignorance and so on. The Bible was written to be obeyed, not simply studied. This is why the words therefore and wherefore are repeated so often in the second half of Ephesians. By my count, I got Ephesians 4, 1, 17, 25, 5, 1, 7, 14, 17, and 24. Paul's making the point. This is what you were. Don't be that. Therefore, wherefore, this is what you should be. Amen? Okay. Paul's saying here is what uh, uh, Christ has done for you and I, let the light of who he is show forth. We are to be doers of the word, not just hearers. James 1.22 tells us this. The fact that we have been called in Christ. He says that in Ephesians 1.18. And I think we're going to have that on the board for you. It says the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. Why? That ye may know what is the hope of his calling. What is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. We are not called just to have an intellectual understanding of who Christ is. That's the American Jesus. That's what we're teaching our people today. You just ascend intellectually to who he is, and you're good. You can continue living any way you live. You can continue doing it any way you want. You have liberty in Christ. You can just intellectually ascend to the fact that Jesus died on the cross for you, and you're good. However, I would hardly suggest to you that's not what 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 says. No. 
the intellectual person, they're on the same par as the devils. And the devils tremble. Okay. No, what, what we need to get to, and this is where the rubber meets the road. See, intellectually believing in something, okay, that's good, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do it. You see what I'm saying? Like, you can intellectually believe the Jaguars are good. doesn't mean they are. Right, Ray? <laughs> okay, quiet down. Right? You can, we can intellectually believe something, but if you don't do it, then do you really believe it? Like, there's that, that, that fine line of, Paul's not asking us in Ephesians to intellectually believe what he's saying. What Paul is asking for in Ephesians is, because he did that, there's a whole new life now. A whole new life. And that's what he's trying to get us at. The fact that we've been called in Christ ought to motivate us to walk in what? Yes, but he hasn't gotten there yet. What has he been telling us to walk in up to this point in Ephesians? Unity. He hasn't gotten to walk in the Spirit yet. He's, the, the point he's pushing home to us right now is walk in unity. Do you think that's what we're doing in these last days in the church? You can't put two churches next to each other and be in unity. It's so out of unit. Who do you think has had his hand in that? Who's the one that brings about division? Who's the one that is going to cause those issues? Who's the one that's going to, to come in between those things? That's Satan. And he'll use anything and everything at his disposal. That's why Jesus had to blur some lines for us. That we look at that and we go, whoa. You know, things like, if you love your mother and your father more than you love me, you are not worthy to follow me. Whoa, what did he just say? That's a tough one to take. Because that's not what we, we think. Do you see what I'm saying? He, 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 he says, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a Sword. That's a tough pill to swallow. A lot of us look, think about that and we go, oh, I, I don't know about that. But I just want you to know that's okay. If you don't know about that, just know that that came right from Jesus' mouth. See, he understands the war we're in. He understands the battle we're in. We are in a fight, man. Whether you think you are or whether you don't, <laughs> doesn't mean you're not, right? It's like, it's like the idea of, well, oh, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't think he's real. Well, okay, doesn't mean he's not real just because you don't believe it. You follow what I'm saying? Like, you're going to find out one day just how real he is. <laughs> okay, atheist, you're going to get it one day. One day you're going to realize that the fool has said in his, in his heart there is no God. You're going to find out one day just because you say it doesn't mean it's true. But what has happened in our mentality in America, and, and I think some of, our, of the older folks in this room are going to probably be able to identify what I'm saying. Uh, we've had a major shift in thought and attitude in the last 15, 20 years. I've, I notice it. I can't imagine how some of our older folks feel about that because, man, wow, our generation that we're living in now, they have no understanding of what authority is. They have no understanding of, uh, we live in a country where it's, you know, the woke generation. What are you woke from? That sounds very devilish to me. That sounds like what the devil wants to do. Isn't that what the devil did to Eve? He woke her. Right? Let's stop and think about that for a second. It's exactly what he did. We ought to motivate to be walked. We ought to be motivated to walk in unity, i.e. 1 Corinthians 
1.10. And the fact that he uh, has been raised from the dead, Ephesians chapter 2, should motivate us to walk in purity, Ephesians chapter 4 through Ephesians chapter 5, or as Paul told the Romans in a very nice little neat little way, he said, walk in newness of life, Romans 6.4. Amen? Amen? We are alive in Christ. We are uh, uh, not dead in sins. Therefore, we are to put off the old man and put on the new man. That's where he's headed in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. We are to, can I say it like this? We are to take off those stinking grave clothes and put on the grace clothes. You're no longer that. You're no, we're just a church full of sinners. If that's what we are, then that's all we'll ever be. We're not a church full of sinners. The church is not a hospital for sinners. The church is not the place to continue to act like you used to be. That's not what the church is. The church is the place to come and act like the saints you've been called to be. We got it backwards, man. We use church for the very wrong things. And all I know is I read Leviticus, and I hope some of you have too. He, God does not want that in the camp. He says, get rid of that. That's not what we do in the church. In the church, we invite that. Think about it, right? We invite that. And I would say, why are we inviting that? This church within itself has seen so much damage it can do when you invite that. We don't want to invite that. We don't want to be that. And if we are that, well, why? Let's stop being that. Note the emphasis that Paul is putting on thinking um, and of course, you can't note this yet because we didn't read the verses, but thinking, uh, well, yes, we did. Uh, thinking in verse 17 and 23, understanding in verse 18, ignorance in verse 18, learn Christ in verse 20. We are not to walk, number one, in vanity and ignorance. So are you doing what you're doing because the Bible said not to do it? Are you doing what you're doing because the Bible said not to do it? Or are you doing what you're doing because his mind is in you? So if the Bible says not to do something, the question then becomes, why are you still doing it? Hey, that's for all of us. If the Bible says not to do something, it's not our obligation, it's not even our privilege, it's not even our right to question what God said. Ask Job about that. God let him have a little... Little of his mind on that matter. It's not our question. If the Bible says to do something or the Bible says not to do something, okay, what is our ability to do is either listen to what he said or don't. Okay? Now, if we listen to what he said, there are good consequences that are going to come with that. If we ignore what he said, there is some grave Consequences are going to come with that. Because choices always have consequences. And this is one of the greatest reasons why I can't buy Calvinism. God always gives us choice. Right. He always gives us choice. And it's our choice to either listen or not. He will make us listen. And he will not make us not listen. Because we were chosen to go to heaven and we were not. That's, that's bad. That's bad teaching. As Kathy would say, bad juju. Not right. We always have a choice. Always do. If you do A, not doing what the Bible, when the Bible says to do something, we don't do it. If you do A, the problem is, and we have to understand this, the problem is we'll always seek to find loopholes to why we can. Well, yeah, but that's just not me. That's not my, 
that my situation is different than theirs. God didn't understand my situation. Or, or, or whatever we do to justify our actions. Even though the Bible clearly says no, somehow we have found the loophole and it doesn't apply to me. Now, let me tell you why we do that. <laughs> because our flesh is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Our heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Our flesh is going to pull us into what we want every time. And you want to know why Paul's bringing this up right now? Because he just came off to the, the very understanding of why he gave you a gift of a pastor. Why did he give you a gift of a pastor? A good biblically grounded pastor who knows his Bible. Why would he give you that gift? Because he knows that if you don't have a good grounded biblically pastor that you can lean on, guess what you're going to do? You're going to walk as other Gentiles. You're going to walk in the vanity of your mind. You're going to have your understanding darkened. You're going to be alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them. You're going to be blind in your heart. You say, no, I don't need a pastor for that. Really? God just, we just talked about the importance of how God set this all up as a what? How does God view the church? As a family. When the kid... When the kid, come on, parents, y'all know what I'm talking about right now. When your child makes choices that are, that are not good choices, you're kind of scratching your head going, why didn't you come to me and dad? And then unfortunately, they have to suffer the consequences of the bad choice they made. Right? And let me tell you what happens because this is what our flesh does. This is what blindness and ignorance does. See, when you make a bad choice, what does it always lead to? Another bad choice, which always leads to what? Another bad choice, which always leads to what? Another bad choice. And then the parents looking at their kid going, what happened? This is not who I thought you were, man. What, what went down? Why wouldn't you come to us? Why wouldn't you let us help you? Why wouldn't you let us... Walk you through this. Anybody? Any parents out there? Amen. Amen. Tell me I'm wrong. Uh, I mean, God warns it. <laughs> he tells you this is what's going to happen. And somehow we don't view the church the same way. You know, because when our kids go doing whatever they do, right, what's the reasons for doing that? I don't need dad. I'm smart enough to do this on my own. I got this. Who needs dad? Well, now you found yourself in trouble, didn't you? Do you need dad now? It's almost like God wrote the book. But we live in a society now where we're being taught, even when we make our bad decisions, they're good. We don't recognize they were bad. We've gotten to the place where we call good evil and evil good. So now we think that our immature decisions are actually good. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. And then we start to justify our bad decisions as if we know what we're talking about. I know the Bible. I know what it says. I, I know what I'm doing. Yet you have the, the pastor over here going, <laughs> yeah, no, that is definitely not Bible, what you just did. And then if I, or if Robert, or if a pastor tries to tell you that, you want to know what the reaction is? Who the heck are you to tell me? I'm the pastor. I'm the one that God gave this discernment to. He didn't give that to you. You're the child in the situation. You have to understand how God looks at this. I've been given to you, Robert's been given to you to look at your blind spots. Oh, I can do that on my own. Well, then why are you doing what you're doing? You're not doing it on your own. I'm watching you lead to destruction. 
That's wrong. Well, who the heck are you? In the, the family unit, I'm your dad. Listen, I was a gift given to you by God. Isn't that what Paul just came off the heels of here? Isn't that what he just said in verse 11 through 16? He just explained th that we no more be what? Use the word, come on. Children tossed to and fro by every weight of doctrine, following our own little course like we think we're smarter than everybody else. We will do that every time. Well, I'm, I'm a much more mature Christian than, 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 than you think I am. I, I don't care how mature of a Christian you think you are. You got blind spots. We all do. I have them too. That's why I need other people to go to and say, hey, man, I'm going to explain to you this situation. Can you tell me where I'm right, wrong, and different? Right? We got to be able to do that. But some of us, man, we don't, we don't like that. We don't like that because we don't like authority. Hebrews 13, 7, Hebrews 13, 17, 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, they're just in the Bible. We certainly don't want to go by them. <laughs> I mean, you know, God just put them in the book for us, but eh, we'll, we'll deal with that when we get there. Well, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 is still here. We got to understand it's not a list of do's and don'ts. It's a transformation of your motivation. That's what we've gotten wrong. We think that church is about learning what we should do and what we shouldn't do. Not necessarily because that becomes rule-based. Y'all with me on this? What church is and what we're supposed to be doing is coming here to transform our mind to be what his mind is. That's different than just not doing something and doing something. Opposed to knowing why you're not supposed to do it. You remember when I used that example a while back? When, when somebody goes, runs in the road and you tell them stop? Right? Because well, I told you. Well, okay, that's a do or a don't. And that's how a lot, many of us live our Christian lives. Instead of getting to the place where we understand why we need to stop. Because if I understand why I need to stop, guess what? When my friend goes running in the road, guess what I'm going to do? Dude, you got to stop. Opposed to, well, I have no idea why dad's telling me to do that. That's ridiculous. I'm going to run in the road if I want to until you get hit by a tractor trailer and you're dead. Y'all understand what I'm saying here? Let me say it like this, if you don't. Let's let the Bible talk here. Philemon 1.6 says that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. That verse just said everything I just said. The communication of your life is going to project the Christ in you. The vanity of their mind. See, it's not a law problem, but a mind, heart, and soul problem. We've got to understand that. Vanity means what? Having no substance. What is faith? The substance of hope. Faith cometh by hearing. The vanity in your mind is because you don't have the hearing to go by. And if you're not willing to submit to it, then you're living in the vanity of your mind. I don't care if you're a Christian or if you're not a Christian, you can live that way. I've seen way too many Christians living that way. This is... That's their authority. Yeah, the Bible's my authority until, <laughs> the Bible's their authority until it hits them in the head. Then, all of a sudden, we're going to try to justify why what I'm doing is okay. Do you see what I'm saying? We have had our understanding darkened. Listen, there's no doubt the unsaved are blind. Okay? But, 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 but understand that blindness 
happens within the flesh. And men love what? Darkness more than light. So why is our understanding darkened? Because we love our flesh more than we like being told what is biblically right. So what are we going to be bent to do? I mean, these, came, these are words that came right out of Jesus' mouth. Romans 1.21 says that because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful. Why would Paul tell us that it's the will of God to be thankful in all things? You see, we look at those verses and we think he's just talking to the unsaved. And although in their context, he certainly has that in mind, let's be careful because we as Christians can be unthankful too. You understand? We can be a lot, we can have, be vain in our imaginations and our foolish heart be darkened. How can I, my, I'm a Christian, how can my foolish heart be darkened? Well, let me tell you how it can be. When the Bible tells you something, you don't do it. Your foolish heart has been darkened. When you try to justify your actions, your foolish heart has been darkened. And we're all, me right up front, susceptible to that. Because we will try to justify things in our own minds. And we're masters at doing it. Professing themselves to be wise. What does Paul say? They became fools. Wow. That's pretty big. To the point where we have a lot of Christians running around professing themselves to be wise. And they are just fools because they're in the dark. They're in the dark. Why were they blinded? Now watch. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are what? Lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine into them. Listen to what I'm about to say. This understanding of what this is saying in 2 Corinthians will help us when we're talking with people about Jesus. Think about what he just said there. See, their mind has been blinded by who? So right off the bat, what we have to understand is when we're talking to a lost person, we're not dealing with physical things. We are battling again a spiritual battle. And that spiritual battle was with Satan himself. And although I don't want to give him props, what I will say is Michael the archangel wouldn't even come against him. So we are, although we are not battling God Almighty, we are still battling a spiritual powerhouse. Satan knows the book, okay? And he knows how to get into our minds and how to attract our attention to the things that we like as we allow those five I wills to well up in our minds. He knows pride. He understands sitting on his throne instead of letting God sit on the throne. Uh, uh, we're all good at that, aren't we? Huh? He understands all those things and he's going to use that against us. What chance do we have in our flesh to reach them? I would say zero. You are going to need some serious spiritual help on the matter. I think Paul's about to get there. Y'all know where he gets there on that one? Anybody? Ephesians chapter 6. Put on the whole armor of God. Right? He, he, he's he's going to get us there. This is why it's so important being around other Christians. This is why it's so important uh, 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 to, to, to do life together in all aspects because we need to understand, we must understand, we are in a war. And this war you can't fight on your own. Well, I can go talk to people about Christ all by myself. I'm sure you can. All I'm saying is, Christ never said to do it that way. Show me one place where he did. All I'm saying is, Paul never did it that way. Did Paul ever go out on any of his missionary journeys by himself? No. Nope. Always seemed to bring some, two or three people with him. 
No, because they all understood, obviously Jesus does, but they all understood, we're in a war, man. We are not fighting against, we're fighting against spiritual wickedness in high places. You aren't going to battle this one on your own. Hence why I said before, would you, would you go fight a battle by yourself? What do you think, you're Rambo? Huh? No, man, you're going to lose that battle every single time. We need to do this together. Amen. One touch, one link, one time, all my prayer, we do it together because there's power in that. There just is. The unsaved man is dead because of his spiritual ignorance. The truth and the life, you can't separate them. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So you can't separate it. We live in such a day where we try to separate it, but you can't. They go together. If you believe God's truth, then you receive God's life. Amen? You would think that the unbeliever would do this because of his spiritual plight, but we need to understand that the hardness of their heart enslaves them. It's past it's about their feeling and their experiences and blah, 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 which they have given themselves to. And because they have given themselves to that, sin controls them. Now, as much as I can say that about the unsaved people, let's be careful. Because just because we have accepted an intellectual assent to Jesus doesn't mean that that just all goes away all of a sudden. No, you're still battling with your flesh. I don't care how mature you think you are. I read Romans 8. And I don't know that anybody in this room, myself included, could say that we're far more spiritual powerhouses than Paul was, who definitely talked about the battle and the war he was in with his flesh. Romans 7 and 8. Yeah, y'all with me on that? I do what I don't want to do. I don't know why I do what I do. I, I, but thank God. He understands the battle we're in. We need to understand it. I think the problem with many of a Christian today is we don't really understand it. We don't get, we think somewhere in our minds that now we're Christians, man, we're gonna, we're good, we're got it, we're okay, we can do whatever we want, and we're just gonna do it the way we, oh, I know the Bible said that, but who cares? I'm just gonna keep doing it. Oh, oh, but then when you see something that you don't like, you see somebody else doing. Can you believe what Ray did? I can't believe Ray did that. What a, and then you start telling everybody else in the church. Then everybody else now finds out what Ray did. And now everybody's turning their attention on Ray going, what the heck did Ray do? Why did Ray do that? Blah, 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 blah. Real good at calling somebody else out. Never looking in the mirror. Never pulling the beam out of our own eye. Using that scripture to justify why what Ray did was wrong. I'm not saying Ray did anything wrong. I'm just using him as an example. But never just, I could be talking about that, Ray. Hmm. You guys, you'll never know which one I'm talking about right now. They're both pointing the finger at each other. So exactly what I'm talking about right now, okay? Listen, never understanding. And you know what? Maybe what Ray did is wrong. And maybe Ray does need to be corrected. And that's cool. As loving brothers and sisters, we need to do that. But don't take the beam out of your own eye. Don't do it because you are just as susceptible to falling into it. Y'all know I'm, I'm pulling scripture right now, right? We've got to make sure we understand that. We have become an entire culture that has lost its perception of moral values. I already referenced Isaiah 5, 20 and 21. Whoa! Unto them that call evil good and good evil. That put darkness before light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own uh, uh, sight. Here I'm going to sh shamelessly plug our Thursday night studies where Pastor Robert did an awesome job starting us off on Proverbs talking about what? Wisdom. Wisdom. Woe unto you that think you're wise in your own eyes. 
hey, I'll tell you what, I don't know about anybody else, okay, but I've, uh, I've often thought I was all that until I read Proverbs. And then I realized, yeah, I need to shut my mouth because I ain't all nothing. Because Proverbs has a way of calling us out for what we really are, you know? An unsaved person's thinking is vanity. He does not know God. He cannot understand the world around him. He cannot understand even himself. He doesn't understand why he has a hole to fill. And because he doesn't understand why he has a hole to fill, he's going to use all kinds of other things to fill it. Please tell me I'm wrong. It's true. It's the reality of it. And that person, I would say, has very little wisdom. And oftentimes what happens is our world has so much knowledge, but no wisdom. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah. You, just because you got a doctor's degree don't mean you're smart. You need a doctor's degree in this book to be smart. I don't care what school you went to. I don't care how you can intellect yourself right out of God. And I've seen a lot of good people do it. And I mean good people and smart people because there's none good, no, not one. The question is, here's a question I want to pose to everybody. Is our biggest problem ignorance or apathy? Which one is it? Because I think we live in a day, I don't know which one it is. We have a lot of people, unsaved and saved alike, that are ignorant about a lot of things. But we also have a lot of people, saved and unsaved alike, that are very apathetic about a lot of things too. Yeah, you know, I don't know about all that. You, 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 you people over there at One Baptist Church, man, you take the Bible just a little too seriously. Well, yeah, <laughs> uh, you should too. Okay, uh, you've seen the meme, right? If you're any of you are my Facebook people, right? You've seen the meme, right? I don't know about you, but he took me pretty seriously. I think I better take him pretty seriously. He took me so seriously that he died on the cross for me. Like, what are we talking about here? You take that Bible just a little too seriously. Well, yeah, we all should. Because listen, the reality is, if we don't, we are alienated from the life of God. Christians, we can be alienated from the life of God, never living the life that we were supposed to live. And by the way, the life of God comes from the word of God alone. Let's try that again. The life of God comes from the word of God alone. Yeah, amen. 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 We have blindness of heart, hardness of heart. We've been dulled. Almost like a, like what happens when you go get surgery? What do they give you? You see what I'm saying? A lot of us have been given an anesthetic up in our veins, man. And we're just blind to stuff. We're dulled by stuff. We're just kind of sitting there going, uh, I don't know. <laughs> And we're getting ready to what? Fall uh, That's where we live now. That's where we live. Sin is a hardening, deadening, blinding effect on people. And the consequence of their ignorance, as we're told, is they have been seared. They've been hardened. What does 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2 say? Now the Spirit speaks expressly. I wonder what that means. That in the latter times, I wonder if we're living in the latter times, they're going to depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And listen, folks, please hear me. Do not let that be up in this place because it can be in here just as much as it can be out there. They will do anything to get their wealth, pleasure, happiness. They'll do anything to have it their way. They'll do anything to do it their way. For, the, for them, the end justifies the means. 
They are their own system of right or wrong. Uh, they will uh, intellectually agree with Christ, the Bible and God, but their heart is far from him. And they make no mistake, those things lead only to death because what is death? It's separation. And what many of a, in, in 1 Timothy, he's, now he is talking about people who claim to be Christian. He is talking about that, that some will depart from the faith. You see that? Romans 6.21 says, What fruit had ye that in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. I mean, Romans 6.21 wraps up what he's saying in a very tight little verse, what he's saying here in Ephesians 4, 17 through 21. What he's saying is, well, what fruit do you have in those things? Why would you continue to walk in those things? Those things bring death. What kind of death? Right? And what does, and your life is what? Alienated. Would that be spiritual separation from God? Y'all see what's going on here and how he's tying this together? Take note that Paul states to Christians, do not walk like this anymore. Note that because you're a Christian, you, or it's not because you're a Christian, that all of a sudden you're not going to walk like this anymore. That's just not the way it works. Well, I'm saved. I don't, I don't walk like that. Well, yeah, yes, you still will walk like that if you don't do something about it. God only justifies. God doesn't sanctify. We need to work out our own salvation. Do y'all get what I'm saying? God justifies. He takes care of the sin and casts it as far as the east is from the west, remembering it no more. And by the way, <laughs> praise the Lord, <laughs> amen for that. But the sanctification process is a process that we need to get involved in. That's why he's talking about working our own, out our own salvation. What he's saying is, God took care of the justification. You need to, what does the word sanctify mean? Set yourself apart for what? For his use. How many Bible verses I can sit here and hammer right now that talk about the importance of that and how we do that? He wouldn't put a premium importance on it and, and, and give you the application of how to do it if it's already been done. No. That's why 2 Corinthians 7, 1 still in your Bible. <laughs> Cleanse yourselves of all unrighteousness. You are his work. You were saved by grace. Anybody okay with that? Yeah. Anybody okay with that? Amen. Not of works. Not anything you did. Okay, good. We got Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 down. But now what about 10? You are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works. Just because you're saved, does that automatically mean you're going to do the good works? No. That's your part now. We need to have an active role in our salvation, if you will. Not, not to get saved, but to be transformed into what he is. That's going to require us to do something about it. Amen. Yet, Revelation 3.17, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, you know it's not that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. It's the very essence of what Laodicea is. We have given ourselves over to lasciviousness and uncleanness it's what Romans 1, 18 through 32 is talking about. Can I say this? A corpse, a dead person, cannot hear a conversation in a funeral parlor. I hope you think about that spiritually. A corpse cannot hear a conversation in a funeral parlor. If you're dead, then what I'm saying right now, you can't hear it. You're not even going to pay attention to it. You're dead. Your spirit's not jiving with his spirit. Y'all understand what I'm saying? I ain't saying any of you are dead. I'm just trying to give you an example. If you're dead, 
then what you're going to do is you're going to sit in the seat. I'm not saying any of you are doing this. I'm just giving an example. You're going to sit in the seat and you're going to find out all the reasons why the pastor's wrong. And I can't believe he said it like that. And I can't believe he did that. And I can't believe he wah, wah, wah. If you're dead, that's what you're going to do. And we can be spiritually dead about some things and be spiritually awoken by others. Let's just be clear about that. When God's word is being spoken, your spirit should be listening. If you're not a Christian, God is not asking you to do the commands that are found in this epistle. Dead men cannot walk, no matter how insistently they are urged to do it. Dead man laying on the ground. Dude, get up and walk. Come on. Let's go. Here, I'll help you up. Oh, you're too heavy. Come on, let's go. He's dead. I can urge him all I want. He ain't going to move. We got to be careful when we're talking to unsaved people. Sometimes we got to be careful when we're talking to people who think they're saved. They're dead. You can talk to them until you're blue in the faith. They ain't going to listen. They're just going to continue to do it their way. You know, if we were in a war, let me ask you a question. Okay, let me, let's go back on that. I'm almost done, I promise. Quiet down, all of you. Listen, if you were in a war, Russia's invading, okay, and everybody got guns, I just asked you, right? How many of you would go, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to run into the cemetery. Come on, guys, let's go. Come on. There's a lot of people in the cemetery. Look at all the people. Let's go. That's what a lot of us think. We go run into the cemetery thinking they're all going to come alongside us and we're going to get something done. They're dead. They ain't going to do nothing. What, do you think they're going to come up out of the grave and help you? They're dead. Church, we need to be very careful. And I don't mean to harp on this, but I'm going to say, I wonder sometimes if our one touch feels like that. We're running, I mean, I feel like, you know, the four or five of us or the six of us, we're just running into a grave going, hey, come on, let's go. Come on, we're in a war, let's go. And no one's coming. I wonder if it's because the rest of us are dead on that particular subject. Just food to thought. Don't get mad. No. What we're going to do if we're in a war, we're going to go get the people that are alive and willing to do what needs to be done and fight the war with us. Right? Right? Come on. I can't just be two people saying that. It's got to be right. We need to do this again. We, Paul says, and he wraps this up. He says, but you have not so learned Christ. His, that's not you. You have not so learned Christ. What does John 10, 3 through 5 say? Man, you guys are killing me. Y'all need to recognize I'm one year away from 50. If you think I can read that, y'all nuts. Because I can't read that. Can you read that, Robert? See, Robert's younger than me. Whew. I got my contacts on and everything. Like, you're sitting right there. Here, let me go walk right up to it. Okay, here's Chris. I can read it. Like, yeah, of course you can read it. Look at it, go back. Right? To him, the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. For what? They know his voice. You know what I think is interesting? <laughs> Thank you. Gosh, these guys. April. Now you're going to think I'm nuts. I am nuts. Can I ask you all a question? I want you to think about this for a second, right? You remember when Jesus walked up to Lazarus' grave? And he was dead in there, right? He had, he had what? He had grave clothes on. You remember that? And, and you remember what Jesus did? How did he say it? What did he say? Who? He called them by name. You know, you, I don't know this for sure. I've heard this be said. 
the reason why he had to call them by name, because if he would have said, come forth, they all would have came out. He called them by name, and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And what's the first thing he said when Lazarus came out of that grave? Take off the grave clothes. That's what Paul's saying here. He's saying, Peyton, Aaron, Kathy, Ray, both Rays, Frank, Robert, Gary, Claude, Andrea, Sarah, David. He's saying, come forth. I am the resurrection and the life. Come forth. Take off your grave clothes and go be what I've told you to be. Don't. You have not learned Christ that way. And you want to know what I love about this? He gave you something that can make it so. Do you know what he gave you? Hmm. What did he say in John 16? Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come... He will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And in John 14, he says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Wow. And he closes that, John 14, 21 through 26, was saying uh, that he was going to send who? The Comforter, the Holy Ghost. So here's my, que here's my question today as we finish right now Christians today want to get their benefits of salvation but yet still live like everyone else that's a lie 1 Corinthians 15 by the way which is the resurrection chapter Paul says be not deceived evil communications corrupt good manners does grace teach motive or allow sin does grace teach motive or does it allow sin? How about this? Grace kills the sinner. We've got to see this right. Grace doesn't teach motive. Grace certainly doesn't allow sin, which is not being taught in churches today. No, what grace does is it kills the sinner. That's what it does. The sinner deserves death and sin deserves punishment. Amen? Yes. Don't take the blood out of it. Don't take what Jesus did out of it. It's not changing the sinner's mind. We got this wrong. You can't change a sinner's mind. By the way, same thing with us. No, we need to kill the sinner. Did he just say I got to go run around killing sinners? Obviously, you know I'm talking spiritually. Yes. What does Galatians 2.20 say? When you went to the cross, that was a death sentence. The sinner needs to get killed. By the way, if you think anything I just said is incorrect, go read Romans 6, 2 through 11. And then you'll realize that what I just said is absolutely 100% correct, because that's exactly what he's saying. To do this, however, we must identify the old man for what he is, corrupt and deceitful. It's impossible to put off the old man without the cross of Christ. And I'm going to stop there because next week we're talking about that very th thing, right? Verse 22, Robert's going to pick up uh, verse uh, 21 and 22, put off concerning the former convers conversation, the old man, which is a corrupt according to deceitful lust. And then what? If you put something off, what must you do? Verse 24, you must put something on. Amen? Amen? Anybody learn anything today? Amen. Listen, if, here's your practical. The final, here's the practical to take from this. The Christian cannot pattern himself after the unsaved world or the unsaved person because the Christian has experienced a miracle of being raised from the dead, Ephesians 2, 1 through 4. His life is not futile but purposeful. 
His mind is filled with the light of God's word, and his heart is with the fullness of God's life. He gives his body to God as an instrument of righteousness, Romans 6.13, and not to sin for the satisfaction of his own selfish lust. In every way, the believer is different from the unbeliever. In every way, the believer is different from the world. And therefore, the admonition is very clear. Walk not. Father, we come before you, Lord. We want to thank you for your word. Thank you for giving it to us, Lord, and uh, giving us the ability to learn from it. Lord, I pray that we would continuously be on the path of walking not, that we would uh, be a church that allows your spirit to show us when we're wrong, teach us when we're wrong, and then that we would do the job that we need to do to cleanse ourselves of that wrong so that we can walk in righteousness. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We're so thankful for your word. Would you continue to guide us and direct us in it? Would you continue and guide us in the direction that you want this church to go? Lord, I don't know if Orange Park is where you want us to be. I, all I know is that I want to follow after you. And if that is where you want us, then Lord, please make it evident to us. Please show us. And if it's not, Lord, I know that you'll do the same. We do love you. I pray that everybody in this church would get on board with what this church is all for. Uh, many and most are already, but man, maybe just take a little bit more further steps. Uh, if we can just become a little closer to you as a uni unified church today as we were yesterday, we'll be heading in the good direction. We love you, Lord Jesus, and, and in your name we pray. And all the church said, amen. amen. Love you all. Have a good day.